It's another episode, Chris. Yeah, we're doing it. This is the third one together, uh, which I'm very excited about. Getting some good feedback from everybody, hearing from all our friends in the mm -hmm. Claris community about learning new things with AI. And we're happy to be here to chat with folks about that. Yep. I'm learning along with everybody. So uh, vector databases, that's where we yeah, said where we're going to go to today. Yep. That's a big one. Um, and I think this is a particularly important piece considering, and, and, and frankly, we've been progressing through the process of communicating with language models. Of course, we started off with prompt templates. That's mm -hmm. really where the communication starts. And part of prompt templates is including context. We spent a lot of time in our previous mm -hmm. episode well, talking about context. So. And so if anybody missed that, it's probably a good one to talk about. And we're sort of still in the land of context when we talk about vector databases, because one of the primary uses of vector databases, which we'll get into what these things are in a second, is to retrieve data. But also it is the it is the lynch the linchpin in a uh, linchpin in um uh, the chatbots. So it's how mm -hmm. we find answers to questions and uh, present those to users in a conversational manner. So a lot, really, really, and I would all say, right, all right, all right. I would say that uh, Claire's folks probably need to become pretty familiar with uh, semantic search pretty soon. And that is that involves these vectors as well. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Anything that has the word search in it, I perk up because search results. Yeah, I've been dreaming about a, another version of it that uses something outside of FileMaker. Um, oh, Matt, I, I, I'm so glad you said that. So first of all, you want to tell everybody I mean, it's world famous, but you want to tell everybody about your search and then I will propose to you what I think you should do in the next generation of it. Yeah, well, I, I rewrote FM search results. You can get it for free at my website, navar.training or also um, at DIS, uh, directimpactsolutions.com. Okay, uh, it's all JSON. It's much more configurable. Um, uh, it's much faster. I really pared it down a lot. And so basically what it is, it's a Google style search you can add to your database. It's also free, by the way. Um, you you add it to your database, you configure it for any tables that you want to search. And when the user does a search in a single search bar, it shows results from every table where there's where the, the data matches. Hmm. So if you put a date in, it only searches for tables where there's a date. If you put in a text string, it searches for that. If you put in something that looks like it's a phone number, it only searches in phone number fields. Um, now, yeah, would you describe, oh, so first of all, if I, if I remember correctly, did you not release this at the San Francisco in DevCon? I, this is actually, you did a session been around for there. a long time. I've done sessions, right? I wrote this like over 10 years ago. Um, um, but it's still, and it has a lot of really cool things in it in terms of like being really flexible. It works really hard to try to show results by, by it, ratcheting it, down. Well, the early version was uh, like virtual list based. Yeah. Yep. And it still you, is to show the results, okay. except <clears throat> the actual result thing is just JSON. So you could put it in whatever you want. You, so, and by the way, because I think this will tee up vectors a little bit too. This is mm -hmm. really perfect. Uh, this, the, the searches that you're doing are the same type of searches that we do in FileMaker all the time. The fancy word from is called lexical searches, which is really mm -hmm. just keyword or index based, based searches. Right. You right. enter in a term and it goes and finds mm -hmm. a matching term. Now there is some sophistication in uh, word indexing or, or the text field indexing in FileMaker where you can just put in a couple letters and then there's actually character indexes as well. But at the end of the day, you're getting back matches to your input. Is that a fair right. way to say it? Yes, and it's not fuzzy. So if you misspell a yes. word, if you put in a date and it's one day off, if you, you know, there's something, there's some stuff I really, really want to have that that's the way Google works that, uh, like for that you cannot do in FileMaker that I can figure. Like With things like mis misspelling, like you said, fat mm -hmm. fingering, or like the John versus Jonathan type searches. Actually, I have which... that. <laughs> oh, you I do? Have a, okay, I have gotcha. a name substitution table that you can put in different languages. So, uh, so yeah, Bob, Bob and Robert, you know, Peg, Margaret. It does the hard ones, but also you can do them in any ethnicity of names. So what if, okay, so here's what your, this is what your assignment is. I mean, I how dare I give my fellow give trainer an assignment? Your assignment is to introduce a new version of that that uses mm -hmm. semantic search. And I can't wait to see it and it's gonna be great. Okay. So it's sometime this summer, let's let's say that. You'll okay. have the tools at your disposal sometime this summer to make it really easy. In the meantime, uh, everyone listening and watching, just to remind people we do have a YouTube version mm -hmm. of this too, in case you case, it, like looking at a couple of handsome old men, 
Uh, how what, <laughs> I, I look forward to seeing it and hearing about it, and it's going to be a smash hit as a semantic search. But what are we talking about with semantic search? Though? What are we talking about? Well, that is where we're doing a special type of search that is facilitated by vectors, non-lexical or keyword search, but instead a search where we find similar meanings to what our search terms are. Yeah. Kind of mind-blowing. Yeah, mind -blowing yeah, stuff. yeah. So it's not, well, there was this thing called the Levenstein distance that I played with a long time ago, which which calculates the number of characters that are different in one word. So if you get a, if you spell it by one word letter off, it catches that, and it calculates the distance between two words. You, uh, you, you you're actually and this is old. I know, but you know what? That's a precursor to transformer technology. Yes. So what the transformers are yeah. really just predictive. You know, what's the next character? What's the next word? And not to not to be reductive. That's it's they're incredible. Like times four hundred billion parameters is what they're able to do. Yeah. But the key word there is the distance, right? So uh, what's implied in the approach that you just described, and also in the modern day vector uh, vector searches, mm -hmm. is the distance between words indicates their similarity. That's where we're going to end up in this discussion yeah. about vectors. Yeah. But we're going to have to do a little journey to get there. Yeah, course. and the Levenstein you couldn't really use it in Pharma. It's really really processor intensive. And you have to sort of pre-calculate what you could use it to compare it to things, but you can't use it for a search because if you type in Ippolite and you put in one P, it, it doesn't oh, know. Page. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for Chris, right? Yeah. So it would have to like do um it can't it can't start with like a word and, and make a bunch of different words that are one distance away. It can just compare the two things together. So basically you could say, oh, okay, well. Uh, I put in Ippolite with one P. I'm going to loop through my entire database and calculate the Levenstein distance of every single record versus right. what I did. Yeah, no, that's not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, then then you'd be back to doing a non-index-based search, right? You'd be yes. doing a search like old school way, like check every single record against your search term. Now, you know what yeah. you need to make that happen is a model specifically trained on language with hundreds of billions of parameters in it to actually do that heavy lifting for you. Okay. So that is why... Today, the discussion of uh, vectors and vector databases is so important. It, it wasn't, it's not introduced as part of the language model boom. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, you know, uh, there are different types of distance calculations. The, the key part is what you said is distance. We want to, we want to zero yeah, in yeah. on that. We'll eventually get to the point that the closer in distance two terms or phrases or sentences are, words, words fr or phrases are, I should say, the more similar they are. It's the mm -hmm. same in, in your formula, and it's the same in, in, in how language models are doing this. But to get there, first of all, we're entering in words, but what's actually happening behind the scenes is numbers being matched. So we should probably talk about how we get from words to numbers in the first place. All right. That process is described as embeddings. And actually, so for our friends who are... are are watching us um, on YouTube. I'll have some uh, visuals, but of course we'll talk through the visuals because we don't want to leave anybody out who's in our ears. So first of all, um, let's just take the use case of a chat bot where we're asking a question of some data and some answers are coming back, okay? Um, that's like, uh, we've talked in previous conversations about like, let's say you go yeah. into a chat bot and you say, hey, what's our vacation policy? And we want it to go find out the answer to the what's our vacation policy. But here's the trick. We want it to be a really intelligent search results. We want it to find out if I, my question is what's our vacation policy. I want it to come back with answers that don't say vacation policy at all. They say stuff about paternal leave, um, uh, uh, plan time off, uh, sick days, you know what I mean? Like, uh, vacation, you know, stuff that even doesn't have the word vacation in it. That's really powerful stuff, right? That type of search is called a semantic search. So in order to be able to match words that do not have the same, or the phrases or questions and answers that don't have the same words or index in, in, mm -hmm. uh, in common, we have to convert the words into numbers. We're human. I mean, mostly I'm human. I know you're human for sure. We speak in words, right? Do you know what language computers use to talk to each other? <laughs> yeah, they speak in numbers, right? Yeah. So we have to figure out a way to actually convert words to numbers. And so th that process is called embedding. So we actually take text data 
and turn it into numbers. Now, the structure of the numbers is important, but the concept of embeddings, let's just focus on that first. Mm -hmm. So what, first of all, embeddings use very specific, uh, specifically trained language models that are called embeddings models. There used to just be like a couple out there, um, like a very popular one is OpenAI's ADA model. Mm -hmm. uh, they've now updated, uh, OpenAI even has multiple different models. Um, there's a ton of different models out there. And, and by the way, I should just mention, there are different embeddings models for different use cases. So what we're talking about is searching, but there's like pairing and clustering and classification and all sorts of stuff. So anyways, right. we won't get into the weeds on those, but. Um, so what we do is we take text and we feed it over to one of these embeddings models. And what it does is it actually uh, turns it into numbers. So uh, what's actually happening there, uh, for uh, those on YouTube, I'm actually showing some word embeddings with just two columns of numbers. Now, the first thing is, Matt, when we turn, so first of all, let's just talk about if we didn't use embedding models. So what we're really trying to do when we're coming up with these numbers is come up with features of a word. So let's do a little thought experiment right now. Let's pick one of these words. How about soccer? And I'm going to ask you as a human brain, give me as many features as you can about the word soccer. Let's see. It's a sport. It's also a type of ball. Uh, yep. It's associated with the hexagonal black and white ball. Uh, let's see the it may be the ball may be by different companies. Uh, you've got some famous players. Um, it's the number one sport in the world outside of the US uh, where they call it football, rightly, because you actually use your foot to play it. I'm like, it makes sense. Yeah. Anyway, I'll give um, I shouldn't really, you're, you're a huge lover of American football, so I'm not uh, going to. But um, I get it. I get the irony. Let's see. I don't know. It rhymes with it's like the word sock, <laughs> like what you wear on your feet. It's not the same word. So uh, yeah, those are the type of thing, things I could think of. So I, I don't probably go. I can give you 4,095 more if you want. Okay. So that's, that's the whole idea. So you're a super smart dude, by the way, that was fun. That could be like a game show, by the way, uh, you know, human, human embeddings, right. whatever the big game show. So what, so, so if we left it to humans to come up with features, we would probably in a really good case, we could come up with certainly a couple, certainly a dozen, maybe if we really tried hard, like and spent a ton of time on it, we could come up with a hundred, but we'd get into a real long tail situation there. These models, these embedding models, these spe specified uh, language models for this task have up to 4,096, even more. Uh, really, the most common ones, like the ones we use the most um, at iSolutions are like 300 feature models. Mm -hmm. I don't know they call that, but for the sake of this discussion, we'll, we'll call it that. But 4,096 ones are very sophisticated too. So they, So what that means is these models can look at a word and extract hundreds and hundreds of features from it and stuff that is way beyond our level of mm -hmm. comprehension. Mm -hmm. And the reason that they do that is because they will plot these. Now, you know, when we talk about plotting, everybody knows X, Y, right? X, Y is literally two, uh, you know, yeah, it's two dimensional a, a two uh, graph and you can plot it in some quadrant. And that right. tells us two things about the plot. It tells us what whatever the Y descriptor is and whatever the X descriptor is, right? Mm -hmm. We all get it. We look at yeah. those every day. Imagine if you will, and for those that are on YouTube, they can see this fantastical 3D multi-dimensional graph. So uh, I'll let you try to describe what we're looking at here, but um, it's- Well, a, basically just another dimension, X, Y, and Z. Yeah, many, many, uh, many, many, so many, so yeah. many dimensions that we can actually plot all 4,096 of these features. So well, when you could we, with X, you could with X and Y, I mean, just be big. Yeah. Anyway, but you would have two features that you're plotting. Right. Like that's yeah. that's the important takeaway. Right. If we wanted to plot all 4096, we need other dimensions. We're no longer in a two dimensional space. Right. Got it, got it. Or so three dimensional. It, right? so we're or or three for that matter. Yeah. It's really multi dimensional. That's what you can't. You can't really visualize that. <laughs> right. No, it's yeah. not real. No, you can't. And and that's why we use models for this task. So yeah. what? So who cares if we if we plot these? Well, here's what the fascinating thing is. Since the models are actually interpreting extracting meaning from these words using just in you know tons huge set parameter sets of, of, of language to do so mm -hmm. they're able to do things that us humans can't even comprehend and they're able to associate so when i plot like for example for youtube folks we're looking at something here where we're plotting a couple of different words that have mm -hmm. some similarity we see soccer plotted and rugby and there's chris's football down there right mm -hmm. and we even see tennis down here right mm -hmm. now the, the the location of the plot indicates that they have features in common. 
So for example, just to be really silly, if we took the word soccer and plotted it in a multidimensional graph and we took the word soccer and plotted it again, they'd be at the exact same location. That means right. that they have the 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 um algorithms that are used to determine the distances. And by the way, there's many, but mm -hmm. the 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 algorithms, the most common ones are like zero to one. Some some of them could be like mm -hmm. minus one to plus uh to plus one. The, that distance would be like one, right? Soccer and soccer have the same exact location. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. like, if you look at this graph, soccer and rug, rugby are close, but they're kind of they're kind of far away. So their distance indicates their similarity. So by looking at this, would you indicate that rugby is is more associated with soccer or football is more associated with soccer by looking at this visual here? They're pretty I would close. Say it's yeah, but rugby for whatever reason is a bigger dot and. There you go. It's actually, so a little it's bit further, but it's also it's three dimension. It's kind of hard to tell. It's to technically closer. Yeah. We can see tennis yeah. down here, for example, is not right. as close as football is, right? So right. I think if if to help people wrap their head around it, what we're actually doing is turning. We're using language models to extract uncomprehensible levels of meaning from words, mm -hmm. and then we're plotting those words for the simple purpose of determining the distance. The distance then equals a similarity. And so, it's not just words either, right? Isn't it like parts of a word? Not a syllable it, it, per se, but like some other like portion. phrases, even yeah. paragraphs for that meant. Meant so oh, we just so talked about bigger or smaller. Yeah, we just okay, talked okay. about um uh words and then sentences. Mm -hmm. So this is really mm -hmm. we where we get into like what the linchpin is of uh, chatbots. So what for those on YouTube, I'm sharing just a simple graph of some vectors where I'm showing two different phrases, two different sentences. One mm -hmm. is "Hello, how are you today?" and the other is "How are you doing?" Those have very similar meaning, but they're not the exact same thing. So you can just tell by the the vectors that I selected here on screen. And Matt, we can tell the listeners um, they're very close, but they're not identical. So that indicates that the distance between these two is similar. All, however, if we, again, same kind of thing, just to drive it home, if we use the exact same sentence, hello, how are you today? And hello, how are you today? Those are exactly mm -hmm. the same. Mm -hmm. Those we plotted in the same spot. So the whole point is we use, we go through all this process to figure out what the distance is. We plot and then we use a separate algorithm. Uh, like you've heard like cosine uh -huh. and uh, I love Euclidean. I the language thing there too, because I was just thinking like, oh, look, I'm what's this, you know? Uh, well, so. That's what I'm supposed so, to say. So it's, you know, what's super fascinating is that a lot of these embedding models, most of them, frankly, are multilingual. So what that means is, what we're actually looking at on screen here is that the phrase, this is red, and the phrase, you just said it perfectly. Um, Esther is rojo. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Nice, nice rolling R's. Yeah, Those which... two, what's indicated on this screen is that they are point, they are 92% similar. That's not really mm -hmm. what it is. It's 0.92 in distance, which means mm -hmm. they are essentially 92% similar. So, so for translation, you, okay, here's what the problem is with doing translations with AI. First of all, you can do it. We've had customers come to us for this and they go, yeah, can you do it? And we're like, yeah, you could use ChatGPT for it, but here's the problem. You would have to go manually check every single one of your translations to make sure it makes sense. Like you've run into this where you do Google translations and the person well, who actually speaks the language is kind of like looking right, at you funny. Right, right, right. But isn't I mean, it better it, than Google Translate by a ton? Yeah, it is. It's it definitely yeah. is, mostly because of the multilingual support that's built in. Mm -hmm. But here's the here's the key. If you combine AI translations with if you vectorize the mm -hmm. English version, this is red, and you vectorize SOS Rojo, which means we run them through those embedding models mm -hmm. and, and come up with the features, mm -hmm. you can then plot them on a graph and determine what their distance is. So let's say you want to do AI translations. You could do like 100 translations, give them to like English to Spanish, give them to Spanish speaking individuals to to rate them. This is what we right. call human in the loop or reinforcement mm -hmm. learning. And then you look at all those hundred and you go, well, it looks like the ones that are all five star ratings or three star, whatever the top rating is, are 0.85 and higher. So then we consider that to be an acceptable threshold of similarity. So right. then you can now automate tens of thousands of translations without having to have necessarily have a human rate them because you've already gone yeah. through that process. Now, I would recommend continue to go through that process to keep yeah, the quality yeah. up, but that is the principle, one of the ways we can actually use vectors. Okay. Now, how does this actually work from a chatbot standpoint? Well, guess what? A question oh, and an answer 
have similarity, which is crazy. One way to kind of think, I, I, frankly, I think that's kind of nutty. The fact that I can ask you a question and then the answer to the question has similarity to it. That, by the way, is how we can say, what's our vacation policy? And it mm -hmm. goes and finds similar concepts right. like plan time off and parental leave yeah. and stuff like that, right? This one that I'm showing on screen to just YouTube folks, uh, we'll, we'll mention it. This was an experiment that I did that I thought was really kind of amazing was that um, I went and I, on, you know, like Kaggle.com, it's uh, like where you get a bunch of data for data science work. Um, anything you're thinking about doing, you can find stuff on there. So mm -hmm. I went on there and I actually found a data set of 10,000 um, customers making a statement about a product or service that they were interested in. And then in a separate experiment, I found uh, companies like taglines for their product or service that they're mm -hmm. offering. And I thought it would be really cool to vectorize both sides of those and find matches. So what we're looking at on screen here, Matt, the, the need, this is a customer saying, as a busy professional, I need a quick and healthy food option to fit my schedule. The solution or the company they were matched with was a local restaurant chain that offers a dedicated express menu with pre-proportioned nutritious meals for the time-constrained customers. There aren't any, if we did a lexical yeah. search, these wouldn't match. I but, mean, you could also say food bars, Chris. <laughs> food bars. <laughs> you got me. It's convenient. Um, it's quick. It's healthy-ish. Yeah, true. So, okay. but the idea is like, mm -hmm. wow, humans maybe couldn't put these associations together, but we can use AI to do so. Right. The last one I'll, I'll share with you is- well, a, I have is a an question e before you continue. You say yeah. you vectorized Please. it and we're talking yes. about words to numbers. Where does, where are the numbers stored? Are those in FileMaker? Be, yes. Be, well, no. Okay. Uh, great question. Thank you for that. They are stored in a very special kind of database called a vector database. So um, if you are going to have semantic search capabilities in your database, mm -hmm. you would have to store your vector somewhere. So in the examples I showed you, I actually have a separate database. There's some popular ones out there um, that, um, like Pinecone is probably an industry mm -hmm. leader in that we use, uh, some local ones that are like some Postgres databases with, um, you know, the, uh, vector modules sort of bolted onto them, but that's a separate database. So you would have like all your vectors stored over here because it's a different type of storage. It's a, it's a different kind of index, frankly. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to do it in FileMaker, what you might need, it would be something like, like how are like Matt? How are container fields different than other fields in FileMaker, for example? Well, they can store any type of thing, uh, binary. They binary. can store things that are encrypted. They can actually store text, or they can store a PDF or a file that actually has text in it. So, um, if you were to store four thousand ninety six uh, vectors for an associated, like let's say here we're looking at job description mm -hmm. is text. To store the vectors that represent that, that's a ton of data. And if you put it into a text field and you wanted to search it, index search or even numeric search, mm -hmm. you'd end up with a huge index in your in your file. Yep. So the, the standard text field type storage probably wouldn't work in FileMaker. But I bet you if you had sort of a flavor of a container field that could store that information and allow you to search in a more sophisticated manner, you mm -hmm. could then do... You could then store your vectors inside the same database as your data, and then you'd be able to do things like semantic search. We well, now can't search on a container field, of course. So there has to be some connection to the. Anyway, I'm cutting you off. <laughs> no, no, you're you are exa exactly where the brain should go. So these would be problems, not problems. These would be things that the FileMaker platform would need to have to be able to do native semantic search. Right. In the meantime, you can. Incorporate you can, as of today, you can incorporate uh, semantic search into your FileMaker databases just using your vectors stored elsewhere. But maybe someday, Matt, mm -hmm. maybe someday really soon, yeah, you'd have that native functionality in your platform. Yeah, and then guess what? So what, someone what like been... you could do your search. You could. That's why you're gonna. Well, maybe right, if you right, have right. that, yeah. Well, what I've been visualizing for the next version of it for years um, is that you'd have some sort of a trigger that when you load a record and uh, and one time when you start your database, you would load all your data. So your actual FileMaker data would go up to a database like Pinecone. Yep. And then anytime you make a change, that would get updated. And yes, then when you do a that... search, it actually searches in Pinecone, which knows all of your primary keys. It's doing a really, really smart search. And then it sends back a JSON blob 
uh, with uh, the results with the primary keys and the table of the, of everything. So basically, it's a, it would be entirely compatible with the current version of search results. It would yes. just do the search elsewhere. So what you're saying is this might be possible to do, but have the data still be in my database so I don't have any security concerns. Yeah, potentially. Okay. Yeah, and and I think it's fair to say that security sh you should pay attention to security. Like you know, if you if you're using open source models, you can use an open source embedding model, and you mm -hmm. can use a, a local uh, open source embedding model and a local uh, vector store vector database that's all inside your same box. Like mm -hmm. all those things can happen locally. Now, what you just described though is is your homework assignment is to do a semantic search. I have one more wrinkle in there that I think you're right. going to think is pretty fascinating. It's this concept called re-ranking. So re-ranking is where you, I think in the in the context of FileMaker, it would be you do a found set, find all the mm -hmm. uh, customers in Greece, right? Mm -hmm. And we go in and we do other index. What, what you do to re-rank in FileMaker is we sort. And we can get really sophisticated with up to what, like nine different sort options until finally we're in such a long tail that there's nothing that can sort yeah, in those secondary every one of them sorts. Slows it down by twice or so. <laughs> yes. Imagine though, if you could do your search in FileMaker with your lexical index keyword search, right. then re-rank your results semantically. Not sort, mm -hmm. but re-rank them using yeah, these yeah. semantic distances. That'd be kind of fascinating. Right? Yeah, absolutely. That, again, like what you get with Google, right? You get relevance ranking. That's the key. We don't know right. what they're great. That's a great point. It where we're talking about relevance. And you could try to recreate relevance, but or you could use 4096 parameter um index, you know, vectors to well, was, be able to. So that that's when you. like the Levenstein function I talked about earlier kicked them in, right? It's like, yep. okay, I found 36 results in a name table. I know your original search. I can actually loop through 36 results and do a Levenstein calculation. And then you could rank them in order by by the probability of the match. But it, and it, and if you had uh like internal support in FileMaker for like some sort of like cosine calculation that gave you that distance calculation, it would make mm -hmm. it even easier. If um, okay, so we we did it in front of me, you, and both of our listeners. You have to <laughs> do it now. Now now this summer right, we're right, going to come geez. out with the semantic search, and <laughs> we're going to hold all three of us are going to hold you to it. You're going to help me because I need, I'm going to need all help. Right. Cool. Okay, I have I one more question to... about the vector database. Yeah. Why could, maybe it's a stupid one, but I'm going to ask it. Why couldn't the vector database be stored in FileMaker since FileMaker is, you know, a database? Is it a it totally really fundamentally the... different kind or? Well, I mean, the search is different. Like we, because our, in, well, our indexing is different in FileMaker. It's the indexing. Like... Yeah, I mean, okay, like, okay. Like, like literally the index is based on taking an inventory of words or phrases or characters or words in FileMaker. That's a completely different type of search instruction that we're giving the database in order Got to it. find matching records. So it's not it would, at all like a regular traditional relational database. Yeah, model. okay, okay. It's just we're right. storing different things and searching with different indexes, probably the, the shortest answer to that. So it's, it's clicking more. I like this. Good. So that's that is so what we just talked about here. We used a lot of terms just to kind of wrap it up. What we what we were talking about are uh, vector databases mm -hmm. turning words into vectors through a process called embedding. Mm -hmm. And what you use to do the words into vectors is you use embedding models. There are a bunch of different embedding models out there. And the one pro tip I want to give folks is it's not all about there's not just one embeddings. Like it's you have to use the right embedding for the right job. Like that. Um, customer needs and business solutions one that I gave, mm -hmm. that requires a very specific type of embeddings model called a pairing model. And then there's these clustering models that will mm -hmm. help you take, like sort of classify things in a different, more sophisticated manner. Just do some research folks on uh, the different types of embedding models out there. And I think it'll be really eye-opening as to what's possible. And then it might get you ready for, you know, well, at least Matt's, you know, FileMaker-based search uh, tool that's come into theaters this summer. You're just going to release it locally in Greece first? Uh, no, this goes okay. Public. It's it's only it's always been the labor of love. Um, but, yeah. By the way, when is Rome FileMaker? Uh, I believe October. I don't have the exact dates. Oh, we should, we should so look that up. What do you think about showing this at Rome FileMaker Week? Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. 
So I, I, you've heard it here first, uh, two listeners, Rome uh-huh. FileMaker Week. Matt, you're yeah, are Rome you FileMaker planning Week. on romefilemakerweek.com uh, October 7th to 13th. And are you planning on presenting or intending to present? I've spoken at it twice and I submitted another session all about JSON because I love JSON. Um, and I've been using it more and more and finding other really cool uses. So I want to share some of the things that I've uh, been using it for that I never even would have thought of a year ago or whatever. Talk a little bit about your love for JSON. And in case people are wondering... There is a school. There is a a an argument about what the correct uh, pronunciation is. No, there's you, not. <laughs> you are pronouncing it correctly. Yeah. Although I have Jason ingrained in my brain, and I just can't stop doing it. So, well, the guy who invented it, he calls it Jason. Jason, because it was actually named after, I think, his son or somebody named Jason. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, um, even though it stands for JavaScript ob- Object Notation, now, for, for, and it's old. For, it's like it's old. very old. But not only is it, but it's old, but at the same time, it is the absolute most important part of APIs, uh, yes. the integrating APIs in FileMaker. Why is that, Matt? Um, because all APIs pretty much speak that. Even Claris Connect. That was almost a spit take right there. Hell, <laughs> <laughs> the, every, everything does. And so yeah, 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 we, yeah. we have native support for JSON. And have for uh, a long time creating of functions and parsing of return JSON, which yeah. is the reason why I can't do it. I can't call it JSON. I'm sorry. You, you keep doing matter. that. We, yeah, we I'm going to speak to the JSON the folks. Thing. And so, so yeah, talk a little bit about some of your uh, fascinations. Well, I've been using it to store uh, a lot of different things. Um, but one good example that I came across recently uh, is to, to have a field in every table or most every table, just call JSON. You just create it kind of at the beginning. It's a text field. And then when you, you, you're you doing some scripting and you want to store something about a record, either data or metadata about the record, and you don't want to go create a field for it, you can just do JSON set element to the field and then put whatever else you want in it. It's so easy to to add to JSON and to and to delete from JSON and you know change it. Um, and then you can store that. And then that data can show on any layout. It's a little harder to search. So this is not, this would be for, for data that you'd need to display. Um, would you, it could would be you calculated. S- it could be. It, would you call it like a, a packaging? It, it also has a great use. One of my favorites after, you know, aside from mm-hmm. unpacking uh, the data that's being returned from API calls, which is really why it was kind of introduced into our platform in the first place. One of my mm-hmm. favorite sort of tertiary use cases that people came up with was using it for uh, script parameters. Because yeah. instead of like doing like this piped Huge. thing, big old thing, yeah. you That's can just create- starts. Yeah. That's where you have to start there. Yeah. And then and then if you keep going, like for example, imagine you have a whole bunch of Boolean fields. You have 10 different binary things that you need to track about a company. You know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. They, they are in this industry. They're a current customer. They bought something this year. Blah, blah, blah. And you have a bunch of things. You don't want to go making 10 number fields for that necessarily. You're not going to search them. But if you look at your screen, your data entry screen, you want to have some checkboxes. Interesting. So what you could do is you could have a bunch of button bars uh, segments that do one. They don't even run a script. It just does a uh, it, uh, it does a set field and it sets the JSON field to whatever the opposite value of the thing that it was before. So it's like, is current, it would say set JSON uh, to, if it's current, set it to not as current. Oh, you know, yeah. Very, very simple calculation. Mm-hmm. And then you conditionally format the object Because it's the, the output layout. of a, it's the output of a ca- calculation. That's the important part right. that people would know here, right? So yeah, that's yeah, how yeah. you can use those switches to, to update yeah. when you- And any kind of data. So very, I, I don't like going to the, uh, to, the relationship graph to you know manage database. I don't like adding fields. The more the the more I use FileMaker, the more I um, use fields. Use basically the data model for absolute pure only storage of data. There's no calculated fields, no summary fields, no nothing except for regular old storage. Wow, no table. cal no calculated fields. So you're as doing much your as possible. like in the script, right? No, I use calculations and button bars. On the layout. Oh, that's yeah, right. Layout, that's right. I love that digits. about you. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. Tell people a little bit about that too. I just talked. Well, about then that. there's also the new feature that uh, 
that um, you can do with layout uh, object layout calculations. Um, uh, well, yeah, like any so an like example like full name, that would mm -hmm. be a calculated field because you actually have to search on it. So you could search on CRI space IPP and you'd find you. There you go, um, right. Because it just starts with. But if you have something else like, um, give me another example. Oh, like address. Address mm -hmm. a state zip, right? Mm -hmm. You don't, uh, and you, you have it stored in the database as address, but you need it to print on a layout uh, on a form to say, the street address with any number of lines, city, comma, state, space, zip. And if there's no address, put in like no address. And right, if there's, which is, which is t technically a searchable term in that case. And if there's two other addresses, it can say the address and then the little text thing that says, and two more, right? Those are mm. things that would be, that you're always going to be getting asked for more stuff like that. And then if you just say, give me a layout, give me a calculation, and stick it into a one segment button bar that's can, that's formatted as invisible or uh, formatted to look like data, right? So the same same exact specs as what your regular field would be. Um, it can then display that data. And the and the the principle behind using a button bar for that is that that's what sort of like your triggering action to get the calculation engine involved is landing on the layout. Yeah. Well, the biggest actually the biggest reason to do it is so that you don't have to pollute your database with a calculated field. And if you want well, to change right. it, it's on that layout. And if you want to copy and paste it, you copy and paste it. I don't know and if the you're making some other point. Well, no, I just simply that the thing mm -hmm. that actually makes the calculation happen is you interacting with that layout, which means that it, it's not, if you never go to that layout and the user never needs to have that that uh, calculation yep. created, you it never happens. So yep. you're not taking on that tax um, just to load the file. Exactly. Locally, for example. So if you do it, you do a test layout or whatever, and then you toss it, not, you've, you've harmed nothing. So yep. I'm, I'm all about putting the complexity in the right layer. Yeah, you are. I've always and, thought that about and, you. And it's pretty much never in a calculated field. Uh, yeah. I think and that's... it's pretty much never in the, in the relation model either. It's, it's in a, scripting oh, and layouts. Yeah, I remember you and uh, Petrowski and I had a conversation once about like where do we where are we putting all the the mm -hmm. heavy lifting and calculations, scripts, layouts. You were you were taking the position of layouts. I think I might have been talking about calculations at the time, but I I become more of a script guy, um, and right. all of it has to do with like why take on the tax of evaluating all these things and the processing of these if you're never going to encounter that stuff. Yeah. So it's really just like user sure workflow too. based. But so I, you're going to show that at Rome FileMaker Week along with your new semantic search updated search yeah. uh, model, right? Are you doing any other of the European um, engage is? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's the so appropriate there's, term, a, there's the engage you conference. Uh, that's yeah. A, that's an amazing one. Uh, uh, Joris, who is going to be on the podcast upcoming, um, and Johan, they put that conference on. It's amazing. Yeah, I think I saw <laughs> um, an announcement for he's going to do the uh, let's chat uh, presentation. And I, forgive yeah. me if we got that wrong, but, and the reason we're mentioning that is, uh, in an upcoming episode, we at least have celebrities scheduled to appear. Um, so we've talked to Ernest Coe mm -hmm. from, um, Roof Geist, Geist, who's going to, uh, come on and, and talk with us. And you just mentioned also our other guest as well, who, mm -hmm. wait, we're, he's not going to be speaking at his conference, is he? His no, when is the conference? Or yeah, when it's Engage You. <laughs> Oh no, maybe they just I announced the schedule. Not that it's starting. I don't okay, know, I just... but Engage You is another one that I love. I spoke at that one or did a um, panel discussion. Um, and then there's also .fmp Berlin, which is the biggest of them. Oh Although really? I think Engage You was about the same size as .fmp. And then there's other conferences too. Um, um, well, I really want to get now. I'll, I'll mention Reconnect uh, in Asia Pac down in Brisbane. Uh, this year, that's going to be in September. Mm -hmm. uh, my friends down there have asked me if I'm uh, willing to come down again. I've sp spoken at that co uh, conference under different names, uh, Asia Pack DevCon, uh, that type of thing. Oh, I thought you meant I've like had... one time you went as Roscoe Coltrane or something. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, well done. I'm, I'm really wanting well... to know if people remember who that is. <laughs> Roscoe P. Coltrane. That's right. Goo, goo, goo. Yeah. Are you kidding me? All that right. you just that's that was my lunchbox. Uh, I didn't have the Roscoe one. I had the Cooter uh, lunchbox, actually, uh, to be quite honest with you. I was just trying to be on the fringe, really. Um, um but I, that one I just reconnect is in... No, I think this is 
This is the, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the movie, Burt Reynolds. Racing oh, car uh, the you're talking about uh, Cannonball Run? Cannonball Run. Wasn't that Roscoe P. Coltrane? Wasn't Actually, that the cop? No, Roscoe P. Coltrane was from Dukes of Hazard for Dukes all the Hazzard. kids out okay, there. Okay. That, he that was works. the, yeah. goo, goo, goo. he worked for Boss oh, Hog. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and he okay. had the dog, uh, Flash. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, wow. This, boy, I'm knocking some cobwebs out. But oh, not, I love that but, show so much. I, <laughs> imagine those shows coming on now. There's no <laughs> way. <laughs> or even Cannonball Run for that matter. Oh, I um, know. They'd all have to be electric cars, right? And, you know, you wouldn't be able to hear anything and they'd all be going the same speed. Um, <laughs> and then the movie would be over. Uh not to disparage electric cars, don't get me wrong. I just want to finish the thought on reconnect. My friends yeah, down yeah. there asked if I would be interested in coming out um, to go present for a third time, which I would love to do. I'd love to talk about AI. I'd love to make it. Although I'm waiting to see if it conflicts with my uh, NFL opening weekend uh, schedule, which it may mm. in fact current uh, be a conflict. So I, I don't want to tell them that they rank lower than sporting activities for me because they don't. But, you know, it's kind of a thing. <laughs> So all right, I got all... one for you. It might be it Thanks. might be done, but anyway. So this guy goes to the Super Bowl. He bought the tickets. They're like ten thousand dollars. Yeah. And the game starts, and there's an empty seat next to him. And he's like, hmm. "There's no way." And and he asks the guy on the other side of the seat. He's like, "What's this? What's up with the seat?" And the guy goes, "It's actually it's mine." Um, yeah, my my wife uh, and I have come to the Super Bowl every year, and and she died. Uh, and so huh. I came alone. Um. And the guy's thinking wow. like, he just doesn't want to ask. He says, I got to ask, couldn't you find somebody else to come with you? And the guy said, no, they're all at the funeral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well That's done, true. man. Boy, you really, yeah. you really brought that home. Yeah, I'm going to tell that one to my wife and she's totally going to understand. She yeah. won't even find it funny. She'll just be like, yeah, no, of course. So, uh, yeah, maybe we, I don't know, jokes, whatever. Uh, so, by the way, in addition to all those, um, so yeah, uh, upcoming episodes, we're looking forward to getting some of our friends on to talk about who knows, uh, just we'll, we'll we'll announce it officially once we get everybody down. But we're, we want to talk about like the tools that people are using, you know, on their daily, like their daily drivers. Let's just call it like that'll mm -hmm. be the daily driver episode, mm -hmm. like not like what we're doing out in the world, but like literally what do we do at our desk every day? Maybe we'll inspire some people who want to get started because that's really how you get started. Um, the other part is I wanted to recommend a book to you. Yes. Uh, I'm excited about this. I just got this book literally just at the time of this recording, it, the pre-orders just dropped last night. Yeah. So I, I had a chance to kind of flip through it. It's called it's AI, AI for good. Um, and it's by, it's by a, a couple of different PhDs. Um, and it's, uh, uh, the tagline is applications in sustainability humanitarian action and health. And I wanted to recommend it to you because okay. we started in our first episode talking about how we could apply AI to health matters. And I just wanted to recommend this to people. I'm only about this far because I just got it, but mm -hmm. I'm really excited about what I'm seeing. It's 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 an easy read because it's just like, um, you know, uh, like just use cases, like little easy chapters. It starts off with t teaching people about the fundamentals of AI. Mm -hmm. But I find in a world where the clickbait headlines are all about like robots coming to kill us in some weird Terminator yeah. fashion. The more educated you get about this technology, the more you realize that that's silliness, it, just literally how the technology works. So I think yeah. people should get their information from really important books like this, not former funny comedians who trash AI on their silly <laughs> weekly shows that have absolutely no merit at all. Wait, who are you referring to? And call prompt engineers question asking guy. Well, take this. You're talking about John Stewart, aren't you? Hella prompter <laughs> reading guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. the word prompt in there too. Well, I, Anyways, took it, I, I took it as comical, rant. but yeah, anyway, that it was a little bit. No, no, no. Nice. He was not being comical. He was trying to be factual and there it yeah. was just fraught. Like the entire Super AI community. Yeah. Completely. Like the, the entire like people who actually know community responded with just tons of errors uh i i actually i may well, go and that's why i thought a, it was run a language model fact comedy. check yeah yeah yeah. i mean I, I took it as comedy because it seemed to me that he just knew that none of that was true but it was funny and that's hopefully why, that's not yeah. how the that's not how it yeah. was received unfortunately. well that's because the ad community apparently doesn't have a sense of humor i'm guessing hey yeah. Well, I think I think I have a good sense of humor. I think you have a good sense of humor too. So, for good information, AI for, AI for good, good, right? So, which um, plugs into another thing uh, directly connected to that. I was just weirdly looking for AI books a couple of days ago. Mm. Um, I use an app on my phone called Libby, which I highly recommend. Oh, 
Yeah. Um, my the same dog name as your dog. Yep. Uh, and you can get books from whatever your local library is or, or several libraries at once for free. Audible books. Oh, my wife's going to love this. She actually has the library app. Yeah. And you queue up, you can like request 20 books. You have to wait because the library might have like four copies. Talks and, about this all the time. Yep. And if you want to get a book, you know, it might you might wait for months or you might wait for a couple of days or a ton of books are just available right now. You download them to your phone and then they're there. And then when you're done, you just return. Them. And I mean, so Libby is ex like bringing in multiple different libraries yep. in your locale and, yep. and, and allowing you that. I wonder if it has semantic search in there to help you find recommendations of other books you might like nope. based on the ones that you've enjoyed. Oh, well, no, it's yet. a little bit, it's a little bit hard for that, honestly. And I, uh, the, the other thing that's really funny is to connect to what I was just saying. I went to look for some AI books and the only ones I could find were from 2019, <laughs> which was oh, wow. forever ago in the AI world. I mean, no, it definitely was. I mean, I actually a good line in the sand is anything post 2017 will be will un, will be aware of uh transformer mm -hmm. technology and models. So, if you know, anything pre 2017, which is when the attention is all you need paper from Google Brain came out and sort of announced this concept, mm -hmm. that would be well, you know, AI has been a discussion since the 60s. Like well, I, 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 post, yeah. I posted something on LinkedIn about a guy who predicted AGI in three to five years. And I was like, oh, my God, uh, uh, Turing Award winning MIT mm -hmm. professor predicts. But it was from 1967. So like this conversation has been yeah. going on for a long time. Yeah. Um, even the comedians back then uh, were making jokes about AI uh, right. to poke fun at AI professionals back in the 60s. Yeah. The Lenny Bruce, for example, had a great riff on <laughs> uh, on AI. Um so a really relevant uh, speaker yeah. in that. So I'm glad I'm glad there's a new book. It seems weird. Like a book is a book about AI is immediately getting me old. Like what's this book going to be? What's the utility of it going to be in five years? Uh, it's fascinating. Know. I mean, I, I think there's an argument to be made that by the time something is printed, it could arguably be like, for example, oh, here, definitely, right? At, at uh, which is why I like th this book because it's just use cases and thought thought experiments mm -hmm. about like th these are different ways that you could actually apply this and get people thinking about what you can actually do with the tech rather than like historical reference in this point in time. We uh, just to kind of talk about the acceleration of all this here at iSolutions, we do uh, a weekly what's this week in AI meeting. We have to honestly. I take it upon myself to curate you know, 10 to 20 mm -hmm. different things that came out in the news, like mostly what the new models are so we can figure it all out, what the what the the headlines were, um, you know, new technologies, new product. We don't really focus on the products so much because products come and go every time there's a new model, you know, like when the vision input stuff came out in GPT-4V and all the other open source models, like any product that you know, touted uh, visual vi uh, machine computer learning for vision just became irrelevant, right? So products don't really mm -hmm. get us too fascinated. But things like that Devon um, agent, uh, agentic uh, workflow tool that we showed on the previous episode, those kind of things come out. So we have to do it every week. Arguably, we could do those conversations twice a week just so that we're informed so that when we're having conversations. So and then what we do is we say, is this news just interesting news? Does it affect any of our current projects? If so, let's assign it. We literally have a Jira board for this. Or um, let's do it for an internal. Let's do some experiments internally and check it out. Or just this was nice to know. So like, I think twice a week, uh, huddling up and having conversations, <laughs> it will maybe keep you on the front of the That's curve, crazy. but otherwise kind of yeah. crazy. Uh, yeah, can I yeah. share with you uh, something fun? Yeah, um, give it to me. So did you hear about the Wheel of Fortune person who uh, solved the puzzle with just one letter. Wow. So you got three words. Second one has three letters and there's an S, the third letter. Oops, from... I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So we're showing. So just for those, the for our YouTube folks, we're yeah. actually showing it. Um, the clue is on the map and there's three words and there's an S in the mm. third to the last letter. Right. Um, so it ends up that a human brain answered this correctly with one letter. Um, and called Glacier Bay, Alaska, okay, so, which is insane. So we were talking about, you know, system one thinking. Honestly, Matt, this yeah. is the perfect example of system one thinking. Yeah. Like, he by did the it way, in, like, yeah, Daniel Kahneman, who wrote that book, just passed away. Oh, <gasps> are you serious? Serious. Yeah, he was when like this 90 something, like, a, yeah, a, at the end of March, March 27, something like that. Um, We'll spill a little cold brew 
yeah. for a fallen homie, uh, Daniel there Ryan. But uh, the thinking think... fast is exactly that's is thinking fast as it gets, and and it's pretty deep too. Like it's there were a lot of heuristics. Obviously, the guy who got this right. I'm sorry, I don't want to talk over Daniel Kahneman. That's that's sad yeah, news, okay. and he's very impactful in AI as yes. well. But um, but this guy said, hey, I, I I studied a bunch of maps, right? So he filled up his short term memory and and got you know his heuristic muscles ready to add, answer a question like this, and he was able to do that. So what I thought was interesting was. I then immediately took this snapshot that you're seeing and I loaded it into three different models. I loaded it into um, GPT-4 mm -hmm. Turbo and then Claude 3 Opus, my new favorite, by the way. Mm -hmm. And then a third one, which I want to talk about for just a few minutes before we sign off today. And that's uh, Gemini 1.5 Pro, which has a million tokens in it. And I want to talk about what long context windows before, before we yeah. sign off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so... I fed it to all three of them and I did a zero shot experiment. I wanted to absolutely do a, a thinking fast, like, you know, heuristics right. response. I'm here to report that none of them got it right. Uh, GPT-4 and Claude sort of just kept asking questions and Gemini right. 1.5 Pro came back with a, an immediate answer. It was just the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. So even though it was a little disappointing because I wanted okay. to be, you know, <laughs> it, it was a bit of disappointing, but oh, yeah. I'm going to use this as my benchmark test. When new models come out, when GPT-5 comes out and like Llama 3, which is coming out, by the way, next month, um, that's a huge, that's a big deal in open, open source community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the next Opus is, and then when uh, Gemini 1.5 Ultra comes out, I'm going to use this as my my zero shot test. So hopefully I'll be able to report on a future episode that I found one that actually got it right. So that that's kind of fascinating. Yeah, so, that's, that's uh, shockingly hard and good. Um, one quick thing is sort of a sign off here. I'm really, so, uh, one of the other news items is that, uh, Gemini 1.5, Gemini from Google, uh, mm -hmm. version 1.5 pro was in early beta, which I was super excited about because I got to do some long context window stuff. And I'll give a couple of examples of what that means and why that's important here in a second. But, um, that just became generally available yesterday. So um, okay. that means you can play with it in the Google AI Studio sort of playground. That means that you can also, um, now the API is available as well too. And so what does it mean to do that type of stuff? Well, <clears throat> let me give you a practical example for a customer and then a fun one, and then we can just sign off. But I just, I wanted to talk to people about that because the context window in Google 1.5 Pro, Gemini 1.5 Pro is 1 million tokens. Woo. Yeah. And we talked in previous discussions about how a token isn't exactly a word. It's kind of like a it's like a syllable, right? So right. um what type of things can you do with it? Well, I think this is a good I was, illustration. I think I was confusing tokens with um as the vector, vector database unit of storage. I don't uh, know if that's no, yeah. That I, easy to conflate the two. You know, uh, one is a unit of measure to break down words, and there prob there's right. probably an intersection in those in those techniques. Frankly, um, fair enough. Okay. Um, so, so here's an example. A year ago, uh, one of our customers, a law firm, a trial uh, law firm, mm -hmm. um, was really excited about AI. You know, beyond like standard research stuff. So they said, "Hey, look, come into the office. We'll do a couple of experiments." I couldn't wait. I was really excited. I, I think the impact on law is going to be profound actually. And so the yeah, first thing that gave me is. was, yeah, it really already is with all the document and discovery stuff going on. But even from a reasoning standpoint, which I think maybe this example gives it, but anyhow, I won't mention the law firm, but um, I went into the office uh, and they gave, the first thing they gave me was uh, a two week trial worth of transcripts. You know how they have the little court stenographer there, mm -hmm. like taking all the notes. They gave me, yeah, so a, a kind of a long trial is like 17 business days. This is what theirs was. So like yeah. over two weeks worth of days. I loaded all those into the model. I had GPT 3.5 at the time, maybe four was fresh. Mm -hmm. And immediately it was like, we can't do anything with this because this was almost a million tokens. This is 880,000 tokens worth of text. Mm -hmm. Now I could have broken them up individually and just asked questions of a certain day. But, but the whole purpose of this is that these guys, this was an old case, and they wanted to go through a a um um like sort of a faux uh uh discovery for appeal. 
So the whole purpose of appeal is that you have to evaluate the entire court transcript, potentially even depositions and, and all that type of stuff right. I got and evidence. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so with a custom chat with a custom GPT with ChatGPT, there's an area where you can upload all your information. And it's supposed to be able to do it. You because you're supposed to be able to upload a, a ton of information like that. And then it will search it in chunks and it gets you a million or whatever. Is that not the case? Well, chunking. Well, actually, chunking is a process involved with vectorization. When you take documents, PDF documents, and you want to vectorize them, it will turn them into little the, the, the main process is to take 500 vector chunks of data, yeah. vectorize that chunk, and then that becomes a record, a row in your vector database. Yeah. That way, when you're searching and you find like something that looks like it's the answer to what's your vacation policy, it's only pulling down 500 tokens, not the entire document. And this is for, to reduce noise. We've talked about signal versus noise before. So th that, the and then in, in um, GPT-4, mm -hmm. Um, if you have like a 16K, 16,000 token window or 32,000 token window, I think Claude actually has 122,000 mm -hmm. token window. I'm not entirely sure, honestly, but that means that you don't have to chunk a document. You can send the whole document and, and ask questions of it. It right, becomes right, right, part of right, your right. prompt or your, it actually becomes part of your conversation, right? Exactly. And we've talked about conversational memory. Right. So yeah. That's huge. That's very different than having just a knowledge store in the back end, but actually having very, it be part of the conversation. Okay. Okay. Very much so. And so in this case, these guys were giving me almost 900,000 tokens that they wanted to have in conversational memory, mm -hmm. not retrieval, right. not semantic magic, like exact verbatim, this person said this and so on right. and so on, right? Yeah, so you can ask so, it a question like, you know, yeah. Well, and I'll tell you the question that they wanted to ask. So in the case of looking up an appeal, what you're doing is looking for instances of misapplied law or procedural errors mm -hmm. that could be explored for an appeal. And ideally, you do this in real time while like the transcript is being fed to you in the in the um, courtroom. But yeah. as an experiment, they look back on one and I couldn't do it at first because I didn't have enough token windows. So the second Gemini 1.5 Pro beta went out, it's like maybe six weeks ago or something. I immediately called them up and I said, let's do an experiment. I went in on a Saturday. We ran the same thing again at the million token window, which means mm -hmm. now I can evaluate the entire court transcript and... It can give me it has room to give me a response because the right. token window you have to yeah, include yeah, your yeah. response too so essentially this is what we came up with first of all just for giggles we did a trial summary in one minute and 42 seconds completely summarized the trial with every detail of every motion basically Whoa. did like a ai paralegal but the big thing was we asked it to do the misapplied law procedural error fines. It came up with three potential instances of misleading jury instructions, two potential instances of improper inclusion evidence, one potential improper uh, admission of evidence, and one uh, potential improper restriction of cross-examination, which are all potential appeals. And the appeal that they ended up actually going with back in the day was one of these. Wow. So it ended up finding the one. And guess how long that took? Uh, a minute and 42 seconds. I don't know. 93 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. So the whole point is when you have the long context windows, you can do stuff like that. The other part is we'll explore this in future episodes, but you can feed it video. The one example I'll just give, and then yeah. we'll we'll call it a day, is I often talk to people about the, the businesses, about their AI journey by saying, look, imagine if you found out that in two years, everyone on the planet's going to have superpowers. Like everyone's going to be able to fly, see through walls, all that kind of stuff. But you just found out about that today, so you can get a head start. That's kind of how I frame up mm -hmm. like, look, it's it, everyone's going to have this. But if you get a head start, you'll be better than everybody in two years. And I got that that superpower thing. I kind of speculated that maybe mm -hmm. I stole that from the movie Incredibles. You know, the movie Incredibles, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so I actually loaded the movie The Incredibles into Gemini 1.5 Pro, which ends up it was it was like 600,000 tokens. Oh, what are you are you scooching? Uh <laughs> Liberty scooching. A movie Sorry. would have to be way more than that, wouldn't it? It is. As a matter of fact, I'm 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 lying. I put in 59 minutes because in the Google AI Studio beta, you were only allowed up to one hour. But even still, I mean, video is well, just a gigantic. You, it's not just a text. It's like, well, anyway. I I just did another one, which was a five hour city council meeting that someone wanted to instead of having to watch a city council meeting, they mm -hmm. wanted to to do a report to see if they were basically talking about anything useful. Yeah, that five hour one was five over five million tokens just to give you an idea right so it's almost yeah. like a million tokens per hour so that's why i cut it cut the incredibles down to 59 mm -hmm. minutes and okay. i said i i didn't even ask it to search i just said 
I told, hey, I, I anecdotally use this with clients, blah, blah, blah. And I go, do you understand the concept? And they go, yeah. Or it says, re responds back, yeah, I understand the concept. I go, okay, can you go see if maybe I did steal that from this movie? And it comes back and it says, like almost immediately, there's a character named Syndrome who says, when everyone is super, no one will be. And it comes at one hour, you know, at 59 yeah, minutes yeah, or yeah. whatever. And it was like, whoa, it, like beyond a semantic search, no need to index videos. No, I mean, right. I didn't even search for term. I didn't even say, what did Syndrome say? I didn't even know who the heck the, the person was. Well, see, but it. you're just, so if you're talking about just the text of the movie, that's just not that much text, right? <laughs> no, dialogue. I could have I done the same for the transcript, but my input yeah, was yeah. the movie. In right. this case. Yeah, that's amazing. So that more to come on long context windows. I'm hoping by the end of the year that Google Ultra will come out at 10 million tokens. And I'll give examples of different things that we're doing with that, too. But I just thought it's kind of cool yeah. and fantastic and thought that people might find that interesting. I mean, yeah, but I mean, like if you have a movie, I would think you could say things like which characters are most associated with the color red? You know, oh, you could absolutely or... do it. As a matter of fact, I did another one where I put a television show in it. I won't necessarily reveal the television show, but we were asking it to find the brief moment where a sales receipt is shown on screen and what's the total of the sales receipt. They don't ever talk about the sales receipt. They don't ever talk about the total, but it within like a minute, it was able to go find one. It was like, oh yeah, $9.98. And here's hmm. the time code where you could find it. Bonkers stuff. Love it. So yeah, a lot more on multimodal long context windows. What's our next, uh, what's our next podcast? I think our next one is we're going to have uh, some guests. So yes. we'll have, we're looking to confirm our final guest, but we know mm -hmm. for sure at least uh, Ernest from uh, Proof Geist is going to mm -hmm. join us. And uh, we may have some others as well. So we'll just have to get our confirmations. Uh, and we're going to talk about our daily drivers. Yeah. It'll be our daily driver episode where we talk about how we use AI. I think that'll be a fun one. It'll and be good. some people can hear from other folks besides just you and me. I guess the other announcement is you, got, you and I have on the schedule for doing this every two weeks. So yes, sir. Regularly. We're going to do it every two weeks. Uh, can't wait. I think uh, we've got some guests uh, lined up for even uh, future episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them will be uh, a friend of ours um, over at Claris, maybe some others as well, mm -hmm. too. So we'll hear from them on some of their initiatives. I'm actually looking forward to bringing in one of my associates here at uh, iSolutions, mm -hmm. uh, who's a data scientist here, yeah, to yeah, talk yeah. about the PhD difference there. between... Yeah, he's a yeah. PhD in data science, does really interesting work, talk about some of the work he's doing, but really kind mm -hmm. of help us discern the difference between machine learning and AI, right. which I think is a question that a lot of people ask. Uh, and then all yeah, sorts of fun topics yeah. as we go. So, yeah. And oh, yeah. by the way, we might even have a custom GPT for our podcast. That would be uh, sweet. <laughs> yeah, I've already started creating it. That's pretty and funny. so that way that people will sense. be able to go on and ask ask us questions of the ask the top the transcript transcript questions right. about what we talked about and that'll get bigger and bigger and bigger over time right now it's not currently on the store because our podcast is called claire it has the word claris in it and that's a copyrighted term so they have to go review it so i had to oh. submit to it the actual tweet that claire sent claire sent out that plugged our show to say like see they're cool with it so yeah. i think it's a matter of days by our next episode we should be announcing where people can find that all right Thank you, sir. I shall see you we soon. We did it. You bet. Mm -hmm. Cheers.